Um, chronic complex moods such as leg ulcers, pressure ulcers, and diabetic foot ulcers are common in the U.S. and prevalent in all of our hospitals. Um, the prevention and management of these wounds poses a very costly, unsolved healthcare challenge for our economy. And aging populations living with chronic conditions such as diabetes or venous disease um, can lead to these chronic wounds, and those living with various degrees of immobility present a growing need for attentive care. Socioeconomic factors can lead to health discrepancies and impaired doctor-patient relations. So usually the patients that we see are pretty, pretty ill because they don't have the money to see their primary care doctor, or as we spoke earlier, they can't get into their primary care doctor for a long time. Um, so they, their symptoms are progressed. Um, and then the patients that we serve have a higher risk for amputation due to diabetes or heart disease, and they may also be more likely to develop wounds and critical ischemia due to the lack of insurance coverage and proper preventative care prior to entering our hospital systems. Furthermore, um, the patients that I serve at all of my hospitals are very heavy Polish-speaking and Spanish-speaking patients. I actually do speak Polish and Spanish, so I can interact with those patients and help them with their care, but a lot of our providers don't. And a lot of, um, even our, a lot of our hospital systems think that our patients are, I hate to say this, but they, they say that they're dumb. They're not dumb, they just don't understand you and they want you to help them. So it is so, so important to help them and understand them on their level. And also cultural differences. So a lot of our patients who are of European descent and of Spanish descent think that soaking a wound in a warm water bath is good because that's what they did in Europe or in Mexico when really it's not. So they really have to be educated on that and um, that's where I feel we can all work on. Um, effective patient counseling, patient education, communication, and the understanding of cultural and linguistic factors are essential to achieving the, the best patient outcomes. And this comes from fostering a patient-doctor relationship that is focused on trust and individual care for each patient. So in conclusion, patients with critical ischemia have a high risk of limb loss without revascularization and a high um, short-term risk of cardiovascular events compared um, with those of less severe forms of chronic peripheral arterial disease. Uh, revascularization is indicated if it will prevent uh, limb loss and preserve uh, amputation in a functional limb as well as ambulation. Uh, endovascular revascularization offers a lower in, uh, initial risk than open surgery, but recurrent disease from restenosis or newly diseased vessels is common in patients with critical ischemia. So close uh, follow-up focusing on wound care prevention, risk factor management, and surveillance of new and recurrent disease is absolutely necessary. So thank you so much for your time. usually is not able to function. And there's always breakdown in that area. Um, so I try to avoid that. I very, very rarely do a show part amputation. If I can do a transmetatarsal amputation, I will do it. Um, if not, I usually recommend a below the knee amputation just because of functional mobility afterwards. You can't even get a prosthesis for that type of an amputation. Um, but if any of my colleagues want to touch on that. No, I actually talked to a bunch of rehab doctors and the Shirley Ryan that is not really treatable, that you should go to TMA or BKA. BKA. Both yeah, same here. I'm from TMA straight to the BKA. I was at the VA and they used to do all these show parts and they used to do all these shines and mutations and we used to see all the kinds of you know, reoccurrence. So for the not the diagnosis, can you explain what a show part is? Yeah, so a show part amputation, um, I wish I had a, a foot. So um, you have your toes, then you have your metatarsals, then you have your tarsus, and then you have your talus, right? 
and then you have your ankle. So a show part amputation, there are different types of, uh, you can do a show part a little bit differently. So you can either amputate it of where the talus is into the cuboid, or you can even resect part of the talus and the cuboid for that type of an amputation. So it's basically a peg, that's what you're left with. A peg, you're left with a peg leg. Yeah. So you always have to do a TLA, even for like a TMA, you always have to do a TLA. A TLA. Uh, my second question is, okay, so let's just say I, I can't see the light. I get a heel ulcer or maybe a toe ulcer and you gotta offload, right? Mm -hmm. Now my go-to is, and I used to like give that shoe that that has, um, or has it's like the, the heel's mm -hmm. empty. Um, the forefoot so, is empty, right. and then the heel is loaded. Right. Yep. But what do you what do you guys do for like? I agree. I think that's absolutely great when they're mobile. But when they're laying in bed, they absolutely have to have their um, their <laughs> offloading boots on. But I agree. I think that is a great option. Great. The waffle boots. Yeah, the waffle boots. Um, one last question for me is that. So after a TMA, sometimes you don't have that flat, enough mm -hmm. flat, right? So the question is, you know, can you, because I've had this discussion with some of the guys, like, look, can't you just do the, just, just do a TMA and don't close it and use a back? 100% you can. Yeah, can you? Sure. yeah. it may take Depends. longer to heal, but you have to have patent arteries in order for it to heal. Sure. That's my only, um, I guess, discrepancy on that. I won't do it unless right. the vascularization is good. And I have a posterior tibial artery. <laughs> there you go. Question back there, yeah. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, what words would you have for the primary care um, population in preventing even getting to these points as mm -hmm. far as their screening practices, as far as their assessment practices, and um, uh, you know, their discussion with the patients, I mean, the post you know, smoking cessation, et cetera. Yep. But, um, I found that so many times when we get them in the womb clinic, their screening practices haven't even been started. 100%. So I really think that if a pedal pulse is not necessarily non-palpable, but if it's weakened, you absolutely have to get our hero blood flow studies because that's preventative care. And a lot of times when you think you can feel a pulse and it's super weak, you're like, oh, it's okay, they have a pulse. No, it's, it's not. It could be calcified. You could be feeling your your finger pulse, you know? No, so you, you actually have to check all of, you have to start from up here, and that's what they're not doing. You have to check this. Is this as strong as your popliteal? Is that as strong as your posterior tibial? And going downwards, which a lot of the times the patients are neglected when it comes to checking pulses. And also um, neuropathy. So neuropathy can mask any ischemic pain. So I really think that primary care should be checking for that. Just to add to the her answer, uh, which is great. The, um, what I always tell the hospital, and we've actually done this at South Suburban, where we actually have doctors on all the floors in the ICU, and she, she mentioned that sometimes you can, what you're feeling is your finger pulse, right? Mm -hmm. And so whenever I get a call at night, and I, you know, they tell me about the vascular exam, which you know, it's hard to pull from, and they say, I can feel a pulse. I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want to know if you can feel a pulse. I want to know if you can hear it, mm -hmm. right? So they, you can take out the subjective part of it. So if your department can invest in the Doppler, yes, probably the, right. one of the best investments you'll ever have, right? So if you can, if you, you'll get used to it, you can listen to it, and you can, you know, the sounds that you made, the <laughs> and, right? You'll learn what she means by that. Yeah. And you'll learn quickly what's decent and what's bad. So investment in the Doppler is, is, is great. I, mean, I, I got something to say about it. So basically, the struggle with that is that you have to be able to find vessels. Yes. Right? Absolutely. So like, that is challenging. You can't just it's, hand over a doctor to someone and say, like, this is the appearance of the Yeah, they have to be trained. 